I will freely admit that I am a cautious person by nature. You can tell because I wear cargo shorts to Disney World. My pockets are always full. When I go to the Magic Kingdom, my pockets are filled with emergency ponchos, portable phone chargers, band-aids, and bottles of water. Which means that if you're ever at the Magic Kingdom and a thunderstorm were to hit or a severe drought or a power outage, come find me. I will take care of you. <laughs> one time I purchased one of those emergency window hammers designed to break car windows in the event that my vehicle was ever sinking and submerged in a body of water and I needed to escape. Never mind the fact that when I bought that window hammer, I was living in Iowa, <laughs> thousands of miles from either ocean, over an hour south of the largest lake, where the only body of water in the town was a creek that was never more than a couple feet high, but I was always ready. I have been known to overthink, overanalyze, to get lost in my head. I am a data-driven person by nature, and I want to make sure that I consider all options and perspectives and analyze all possibilities before making a decision. I'm lucky, frankly, if it takes me less than two hours to decide what to have for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> so there is a part of me, a very sympathetic part of me, that could readily identify with the majority report in today's scripture passage, the 10 of the 12 spies who exercised caution, but it does make me wonder, is that always a good thing? Is the majority opinion always right? I have to admit, this is an uncomfortable and unsettling story for today. To set the stage, uh, let's remember where we're picking up the story. After years of wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites are now finally on the verge of entering the promised land. They are just a short distance from the border. After a very long and hot and treacherous journey, they have made it this far, thanks in part to their tenacity, thanks to Moses' leadership, but mostly thanks to God's generosity. Time and time again, God had demonstrated generosity to the people, giving them exactly what they needed at exactly the right moment. Just enough food and drink to sustain them one day at a time, giving them commandments, rules to live by and to love by so that they could become a community together. And then there was the gift of the tabernacle, that marvelous, portable symbol of God's constant presence with them to remind them that they were never alone. God gave them just enough to make it through the wilderness. But by far, the greatest gift that God gave to them was the gift of direction, explicit instructions as to where to go so they didn't get lost. The Bible says that during the day, God appeared to them in the form of a cloud, an unmistakably large cloud that would move ahead of them so that they would know which direction to walk. At night, there would be a pillar of fire, an unmistakable sign in the sky, so that when the cloud or the fire would move ahead, they needed to go in that direction to keep pace with those symbols, never to walk ahead, never to lag behind, always to follow God's explicit turn-by-turn -turn navigation. It was the world's first GPS system, God's positioning system. You may groan here if you would like. But that all changed. In a moment, that would all change. Because by the time we get to today's reading, in Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 13, things would be different. Because now that they were just miles away from entering the promised land, it is implied in this text that in this moment, in Numbers 13, the cloud and the fire disappeared. God took them away. God, in a real way, decided to take the training wheels off just to see, just to see what kind of decisions the people would make on their own. I think you and I could identify with that moment. Any of us who have been parents know what that's like, that moment when we take the training wheels off, literally off the bicycle of our child, hoping that as they scoot down the street they would remember everything that we had trained them to do. 
There's also that moment when they get their operator's license and drive the car for the first time, and you hand them the keys, and then you go back in the house and check your phone every 30 seconds. And then there's that moment when you give your child one last hug in their dorm room before you turn around and head for the car and drive home without them. We all know what it's like to take the training wheels off, hoping that people would make the right decisions on their own. I imagine it's what our nation's founders thought when they ratified our Constitution, knowing that from that moment on it would be up to future generations to ensure democracy. I imagine that's what Martin Luther King Jr. thought when he spoke of a dream that he had, knowing that he was working to carve out that dream and that he may not be around to claim that dream. I imagine that's what a group of Sunday school class members thought when they gathered to start a little church at this little corner of Platt and Magnolia, hoping that future generations would make the best decisions to transfer the faith one generation at a time. It's not easy to take the training wheels off, but it is critical that it happens. It's a watershed moment because it is a true test of who we are. So God told Moses to take 12 men to scout out the promised land, to see what they would find. And it does make us wonder why it was that God asked Moses to call out these 12 spies. I mean, surely God knew what those spies would discover, and it wasn't a pretty picture. Surely God knew that those 12 spies would discover giants in the land, a formidable army, masses of of soldiers that were so large that standing next to them, the Israelites would seem like grasshoppers. That's what the Bible said. And sure, the promised land was an abundant land of produce flowing with milk and honey, a veritable paradise, but it would be in that moment that the spies would have to decide whether or not the threats were too ominous and the dangers too large to enter. It's the kind of thing that would make a a cargo shorts wearing, cautious by nature person like me come back to say, it's too scary. That might be why God posed this test to the Israelites, to see what they would decide, what the decision might be, to see whether they would trust in God rather than the evidence, to see if they would live by faith rather than by data. But, but I think this story is inviting us to dig a little deeper because there's something below the surface that is more important than the decision itself that they made. What God was really testing was the process by which they would make their decision because 10 of the 12 spies came back And what they reported, quite frankly, was the truth. Everything that those 10 spies came back to say was absolutely true. The threats were ominous. The dangers were real. The chances of survival were slim. But you know what? The report of the two other spies, Joshua and Caleb, that was also true. They came back to say, you know what? God was with us. We can do this, and that's all that matters. And so what the Israelites were facing was not just the decision to make, but the process by which they would make that decision, because in this moment, both the majority report and the minority report were both true, and they had a dilemma on their hands in the form of two competing truths, and the people had to decide. I think there's astounding relevance for our time today because our culture today is gripped by binary choices of either or decisions, of majority reports and minority reports. We've seen it. We've seen it in the halls of political power, even in this past week. We've seen it in the throes of our denomination's debates over LGBTQ inclusion. We've seen it in our social media comment threads and the ways we interact with each other on social media. We've even seen it around our dining room tables. We also see arguments, troubling arguments about the nature of truth itself. We can't even agree on what truth is sometimes. 
Even those people who would nobly try to fact check and to try to find the real truth behind things are accused themselves of being too biased, while those people who are clearly biased in what they say are embraced for being factual. The training wheels have long been off in our society. We have long been forced to make decisions on our own as a culture. But you know what? That's a good thing. The training wheels have to be off because that's how we grow. That's how we mature in our human conscience. That's how we develop as a community and as a society. But the decisions that we make are often wrong, even when we go with the majority opinion. Just ask Joshua and Caleb. Back in 1999, the world witnessed what is now regarded to be the greatest chess match ever played. One of the players was Garry Kasparov, the Russian chess grandmaster who was widely regarded to be the greatest chess player who ever lived. His opponent, he never faced in person. His opponent came in the form of 50,000 people on the internet who would debate and discuss every single move that needed to happen after Kasparov made his. They would have a 24-hour window to get online and to discuss all of the possible moves and to debate the merits of each possible move, and at the end of that 24-hour period, they would have a vote. And the majority vote would then dictate the next move on the board, followed by Garry Kasparov, who himself would have 24 hours to determine his next move. There were 62 moves total in this grand chess match. It lasted over four months. And at the end of the game, Garry Kasparov won. Kasparov would later write that it was the single greatest chess match ever played. But he also went one step further. He not only said it was the single greatest chess match ever played, he said it was the single most important chess match ever played. This is what he said. It is the greatest game in the history of chess. The sheer number of ideas, the complexity, and the contribution it has made to chess make it the most important game ever played. Why did he say that? Because he believed that the debate was a good thing, that the discussions elicited new options, creativity, sparked innovation, it discovered options, and because in the process, people got connected, and they discussed, and they debated, and they linked to each other. But in the end, it also showed that sometimes the majority opinion is not right, and it is not best. Just ask Joshua and Caleb. Brothers and sisters, the answer to our social ills today is not less debate. The answer to our social ills today is not more polarization. The answer to our social ills today, according to this story in the Scripture, is more humility. It is the recognition that truth is something that we pursue, not something that we own. It is not a commodity to be, cor to be cornered. It is not a hammer to be wielded. Yes, we are called to have conviction. Yes, we are called to have courage. This story today praises courage and conviction from Joshua and Caleb. That is a critical part of our character. It is right for us to claim certainty about what we believe. But arrogance is never a part of Christian character. You know what is a part of Christian character? Humility. It is the pursuit of truth with nobility and humility and an open spirit. Because truth is something that we pursue. It is not something we own. It is not a commodity to be cornered. It is not a hammer to be wielded. And that is why God took the training wheels off in Numbers 13, to see if doing so would make the people 
depend on themselves and make the people own their truth rather than stopping to, to pursue God and to pursue truth with humility. And in the end, the Israelites decided to go with the majority opinion to depend on themselves, and it cost them. As a result, God sentenced them to many more years of wandering in the desert to the point where every single Israelite died except for the two who were the minority report, except for Joshua and Caleb who dared to believe that truth was beyond them, something to be pursued with nobility and humility. This is a tough story. Friends, this is a really tough story. It is full of trap doors because the temptation is to take this story and overlay it into applications for our time, to take this story and to apply it to the divisive politics of our day or to the debates in our denomination or into the bitter polarizing divide that we face today. Because on the one hand, we might very easily see ourselves as Joshua and Caleb. We want to see ourselves as Joshua's and Caleb's, but at the moment we do, a trap door falls, and we discover that we just as easily could be the majority report, because that majority report is often wrong. If the history of the church shows us anything, it is that the church has not always been right. The people of God have not always been on the right side of truth. And if there's anything we are discovering in the nature of our politics today, it is that the majority vote is not always right either. Whether that be in the House or the Senate or the White House or the Supreme Court or any of our local bodies of government, the majority in power is not always right but here's the lesson that this story teaches us. Humility is always right. Generosity of spirit is always right. Courage is always right when it is unpaired from arrogance. Truth is always something to be pursued and never something to be owned. And I suppose there's one more lesson here. The other lesson here for any of us who are troubled by the divisiveness of our day and what's happening in our world, the final lesson is this. God's got this. God's got this. God always sees the long game even when we can't, even when we can only see the day that is ahead of us. God's got this. In the very next chapter, in Numbers 14, God says to those Israelites who had chosen the wrong path, let me tell you something, God says. Let me tell you something about your children, the future generations that you were so concerned would be ravaged by these giant armies. I've got them, God says. Even though none of them would survive, God would have their children enter into that promised land. This is what God said in the next chapter. As for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. Martin Luther King said, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. God's got this. All we can see is the present moment. That's all you and I can ever see just the day that we have in this present time. So we do the best we can. We pursue the truth the best we are able. We do so with humility and with courage. But in the end, God's got this. The training wheels are off. So all we have to do is keep our head up rather than focusing on the ground. To look ahead to the horizon that is before us and to just keep pedaling faithfully, humbly, courageously. We just need to be as faithful and humble as we can be in this present moment. Let's pray together. God, you have summoned us to courage and humility. We find ourselves in difficult days, a wilderness perhaps, but not one that is absent from your presence. 
We thank you for the gift of no training wheels, of empowering us to live with a faithfulness that is required and that you summon of us in these days. Comfort us in the midst of our turmoil. Give us hope when we are fraught with worry, but always fill us with the humility of your Spirit and the courage that is required for the living of these days. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, and let all God's people say, Amen.